State University, Indiana, uh, USA. I will be facilitating today's um, uh, webinar from uh, Star Scholars Network. So uh, before I introduce uh, our wonderful panelists, I would like to uh, um, share some uh, um, information about our upcoming exciting, um, exciting webinars uh, on August. So, okay. Um, we will have a, a star webinar uh, on tips for publications. So uh, Dr. Bista, would you like uh, uh, to share more information about this upcoming webinar next month? Absolutely, yes. This is the one of the uh, webinars, you know, we had a frequent request from our colleagues regarding on publications process. So we have invited uh, a great, amazing colleagues who have published books this year in 2020. So, um, you know, there's some of the names, Darla Deirdreff, uh, we have David DiMaria, Raul Chauda, Catherine Gomez, Rajika Vandari, um, we have Lee Tran from Australia uh, and many other colleagues, Dr. Sam Sarma from SUNY. So they will be talking about their publication process and as well as the tips uh, for publication and collaboration with many of our colleagues. So that's the upcoming uh, webinars. Um, and we encourage all of you to uh, register and be the part of this process and have your questions, you know, answered. Um, in that session. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Liu. Thank you, Dr. Bista. For more information about upcoming STAR webinar series or specific uh, uh, Zoom webinars, you can uh, visit uh, the <coughs> website, our website, uh, STAR, um, Net, uh, Star uh, Scholars Network, uh, or uh, and uh, get email from um, uh, STAR. Okay? So, Um, some folks may already know uh, Star Health initiated uh, a webinar series uh, called Public Health and Education in a Transnational Society. Uh, this is our, this is our um, fourth webinar uh, under this series. Uh, today we will focus on, to, uh, fo focus on talking COVID-19 and changes in higher education teaching and learning. Um, we have uh, three uh, panelists today, um, including Dr. Denise, Dr. Bista, and myself. Dr. Uh, Denise has uh, um, led the STAR ment uh, mentoring initiatives. She has been included internationally for over 25 years in different universities. Uh, she has a rich experience uh, in establishing a branch campus for um, Suffolk University uh, in different uh, continents. And uh, um, under her leadership, the international student recruitment gets significant increase, as you can see. And she also worked on uh, developing a network of 10 international education uh, consultants and work uh, with uh, different universities and colleagues in uh, many Asian countries and uh, European countries. So we are uh, very pleased to have her as our uh, panelist. So Dr. Bista um, is, a, as you already see and know uh, him well, he is an associate professor in the Department of Advanced Study Leadership and Policy at uh, Morgan State uh, University. Uh, his research fo focus on college students' experience regarding uh, classroom participation, um, perceptions of academic uh, integrity, learning strategy in higher education. She published uh, um, books regarding a global perspective on international student experience in higher education tensions and uh, issues. She also um, working on a book theory regarding global student mobility. So very, uh, very significant, important work. Uh, myself, I am an um, um, assistant professor at Teachers College at, 
at Ball State University. Uh, my research interest uh, including international student mobility, globalization and higher education, educational policy study, um, and also um, I'm interested in uh, my recent research project uh, uh, focused more on the role of international education in the formation of social elite. Okay, so um, in the next 30 minutes, you will hear uh, a presentation from Ms. Denise. She will provide us a holistic picture about how COVID-19 has interrupted and restructured many aspects of our, um, higher education, such as how students are recruited and admitted, where and how students are taught, how measurements are needed to safely rearrange classroom, etc. So after her presentation, Dr. Bista and I will join her to form a panel, to make a panel conversation um, that will focus more on discussing how we need to understand the change in higher education, teaching and learning caused by uh, COVID-19. And uh, after the panel conversation, we will have about a 10 minutes question uh, and answer. So that's the structure of today's webinar. So Dr. Denise, uh, Ms. Denise, are you ready for, to start your presentation? I'm ready, Dr. Liu, and thank you for that very nice introduction. Thank you. So um, I want to thank each of you for joining us today for this webinar. And although I realize most of you are probably teachers or academics, um, I want to share with you that my area of expertise, with the exception of teaching enrollment management at uh, higher in a higher education master's program, my area of expertise is in the administrative functions of recruitment, admission, registration, retention, and graduation. So a lot of what you will hear today may not be directly uh, impacting you, but it it will, it will impact you uh, in the future uh, because those beginning uh, administrative functions, which have changed dramatically, will ultimately trickle down into what uh, academics and teachers and faculty do in the next uh, coming months. Next slide. We shall never again be as we were. I always love starting um, webinars like this with that quote because I believe um, one, of the high, one of the most difficult things that we are facing right now is people believing that after we get a vaccine or after the, the confusion and the panic of COVID-19 passes, we will just go back to being what we were, in my opinion. That will never happen. There will never be a new normal. There will only be the normal. So what impact, and I'm sure all of you participating in this webinar today could probably answer the question on this slide better than me. What we do know, next slide, what we do know is that COVID-19 has disrupted every aspect of higher education, how we recruit students, how we register students, how students are taught, how they are arranged in, in classrooms if your university is planning to have in-person classroom instructions. Uh, every aspect, the research that you do, the research assistant funding that is so vital to a lot of the research projects that are underway throughout the world, all of this has been disrupted whether you are from the United States uh, or listening for other parts of the world, federal and, straight and state um, funding for higher education will be impacted because state and federal budgets are, are decimated by the virus. We will probably have, if we are not already, in a worldwide recession. I know there are parts of Asia that have already declared that we are in a recession. And just before um, I started uh, zooming in uh, to this meeting, uh, I've received information that uh, the US economy has shrunk by 35% in this last quarter. So the impact of all of this is, is not just for 
the fall term or the spring 2021 term, this is going to have long lasting uh, implications for all of us. And the most important thing, in my opinion, is to realize that, to realize that we have these disruptions are not going to go away. What do we know? We know that there have been furloughs layoffs. Now we're moving into permanent layoffs. Um, we administrative and academic staffs have been reduced. The financial um, difficulties that are created by declining enrollments, fewer international students, and as I just mentioned, reduced federal and state funding and less fundraising. Uh, probably for some of you in the United States, one of the most uh, difficult things that you might be facing is if your university decides to defund your pension plans. There are several universities that have already decided to do that. Next slide. And at least 550,000 higher education employees in the United States have already been terminated or furloughed. I should share with you that that is a two month old statistic. I don't have uh, latest statistics on how many uh, additional higher education employees have been terminated. So what does that mean? I'm terminated or are furloughed. It means that perhaps your department may contract. It means that you will have fewer resources. It, for a variety of reasons, we're not gonna be traveling to conferences. We're not gonna be bringing colleagues into uh, our countries, into our universities for collaboration. The long lasting effects of this virus, we are just beginning to understand. Okay. Again, uh, the majority of you are probably already doing this. Most colleges and universities will incorporate uh, online learning with classroom instruction, but one of the largest uh, organizations in the United States, uh, the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, uh, published a report recently. 60% of the universities were considering or have already decided to remain fully online, but almost 50, almost 60% of American parents would support enrollment at an institution only offering online courses. And those parents do not want to pay the same amount of money, the same amount of tuition for online instruction as for in-person instruction. All of the admission and uh, practices and recruitment practices have already changed. If you are recruiting students, you no longer can travel to recruit them. You no longer can bring students to your campuses for admission days, for uh, looking at your university from the perspective of, do I want to enroll here in the future? And admission uh, based on SAT scores or ACT scores, I believe will be a thing of the past. I do not believe that they will be coming back. And that has some positive implications. Remember, the, the virus has shed a very bright light on some of the difficulties and some of the inefficiencies in higher education. And along with, again, in my opinion, along with outdated business models and outdated admission practices, um, I believe that some of the criteria that we used to use for admitting students to our universities will be changed. The University of California system is the largest system in, in the United States. They have decided that they will create their own admission criteria examination. And I believe at least in the United States, that will be, um, that will be throughout the United States. Many other schools will uh, follow suit of California. What are we all doing today? Um, I talked with Dr. Bista before we began this and I said, I am so zoomed out. We are, this is the only way that we can communicate at this point in, in time. Whereas we would have gone to a conference, this would have been a conference that many of you would have heard me speak in person. We don't have that. Look at this figure from Zoom. I found this very interesting. And again, the latest data that I have is from March 23rd. 
The average number of Zoom downloads was 56,000 in January. On March 23rd, on one day, it was 2.13 million. And I am certain that that is a much larger figure at this point. Zoom has, uh, or if it's IBM meetings that you use or other um, platforms, has its advantages and it has disadvantages. But this is one of the disruptions that will be with us for a while. In Next slide, please. In admission, we now have virtual admission tours, open house days, registration, academic conferences. None of the, all of these things now are going to take place either from home or from office. I think it was that Google announced this week that all of their workers until the end of 2021 will be working from home. Now, they may know something that we don't, but it's an admission in my estimation that this, the disruptions caused by this virus in all of our industries, not just higher ed, but we're talking about higher ed today, but all of this disruption is going to be with us for a, a good long period of time. I liked this um, uh, quote from a professor at the University of, Ta of uh, Toronto. The emotionally and spiritually sane response is to be prepared to be forever changed and at least from the colleagues that I have been dealing with, this is the most difficult thing for them to wrap their heads around because it, it is, change is difficult. It's difficult whether you're teaching, whether you're a university president, whether you're an admission officer, whether you're the chief financial officer or whether you're fundraising. Change is very difficult, whether it's in higher ed or any other industry. But it is really, um, I think, the bedrock of, of where, first, what we have to understand before we can go forward. Next slide, please. What are some of the opportunities? Because there are always opportunities that, that disasters or disruptions create. And so the first one that I see is the restructuring of the academic year combining both in-person and online learning. Why can't we have this? Why does it have to be that online learning is terrible or you can only have people in person? There are, um, there's one university in the United States that I am really fond of using this as an example. Very early on in March, they decided, because I believe their president has a vision, they decided that regardless of what, the, the virus did, they were going to do it this way. They would bring their freshman class to campus. Everybody has a single room. They would bring their seniors to campus. Everybody has a single room. The sophomores and the juniors took their classes online. And in the next semester, they would switch. And that made a great deal of sense to me. It also gave, because I spoke to a parent of an accepted student at Haverford. It gave that parent a sense of security that the university was on track. They knew what they were doing. They had a vision of what they wanted to look like at the end of the semester. I believe that the two semester um, scenario is done. It's finished. I believe that we will have to create three semesters, a 12 month long academic year. And following that, there will be a 12 month admission and recruitment year where students are evaluated on a, on a monthly or weekly basis in admissions. Why do, why do students have to wait months to get a decision and all the decisions go out at once? If you have multiple times when you can enroll, then you have to have multiple times when you can be accepted or denied to enroll. And so I believe that there will be um, multiple times, multiple admission times when students will be notified. And I do believe the best admission offices will have that information going out 24 to 48 hours after review of credentials is complete. There is a, a, a slight bit of research to prove that um, some of some universities around the world are structuring gap years that make sense. They are um, 
they are effective. Some of the schools are creating um, gap year programs, which can then be translated into some academic credit. And there are some families throughout the world who simply don't feel they have enough information or they are safe enough to send their child away, either uh, to a different part of the country or to a different part of the world. And I do think that we will be creating separate courses for residential and for online students. That's an opportunity that COVID has created. Next slide. Uh, the business models um, need to be changed for a long time. New financing options were, we have so many financing options that are antiquated and people are now asking, what am I paying money for? What am I getting out of this experience? I don't want to pay the same amount of money if my child is taking only online courses for a semester the, if, or if he or she is taking courses uh, in person. So new business models will have to be created, and it is about time. There is too much student debt, especially in the United States, where the average student debt is equivalent in many cases to a mortgage, to a house mortgage. And so I look forward to seeing some creative refinancing um, schemes, mechanisms put in place by creative um, chief financial officers. This I thought was interesting, um, this quote from uh, Andrew Connors, because while I, some of my remarks may be US centric, they are clearly, this disruption is clearly worldwide. And so Mr. Connors, who's from Lloyd Banking Group says, every university we have spoken to expects to be impacted by the virus. And for some schools, the potential loss of income is projected to be greater than 100 million pounds. And that was before you factor in that losing new students has a multi-year impact. So again, it's not just the money that we do not receive in tuition in the fall or the spring term. It is three or two or four years, hence, because you will not have those student, that student revenue. And again, what how do universities uh, pay for their, um, their enterprise? Tuition from students, fundraising, auxiliary services like room and board and the bookstore and things like that, and then grants and, and funding from federal and state governments. Those are the four ways that universities can have in the past financed their educational enterprise. All of those mechanisms, all of those things have been disrupted. What can we do? I think that um, to create collaborations, not competition between local, national, and international colleges and universities. Um, when I was the Vice President for Enrollment and International Programs at Suffolk University in Boston, one of the bedrocks of our recruitment, if you will, which I called cohort recruiting, recruiting cohorts of students, not one by one by one by one, but cohorts of students. And we did that through a series of articulation agreements, two years in a particular college abroad or in the United States, and then two years at Suffolk University in Boston. When I established a branch campus in Madrid, Spain, and in Dakar, Senegal, the students took two years of the courses there. They were all Suffolk approved courses. And then they took two years at the Boston campus. They lost no time. They lost no credits. Um, it was a very effective way to increase our enrollment and also to give students the opportunity to have two years of a less tuition expense because the students at those two colleges paid half of the tuition that they paid in Boston. This is a wonderful quote. I'm sure many of you have seen it. I'm sure many of you have used it, but it's on here. In 1665, Cambridge University was forced to close because of the plague. Isaac Newton decided to work from home. He discovered calculus and the laws of motion. Just saying. Um, 
this is a tremendous opportunity for us. Again, I was talking with Dr. Bista before we began speaking, and yesterday I was part of a panel discussion with uh, ministers from Canada, all over Canada, higher education ministers. And the theme is, yes, disruption. The theme is, yes, retraction. The theme is, yes, change. But the business of higher education is change. That's really the, bi the business of it. And I do believe that in the future, it is not the reworked university. It is not doing things at the margins and hoping that things will be okay, that students will come back, that the virus will magically disappear and never resurface. We don't know any of that, but it is the reimagined university. And in order to have a reimagined university, you have to have a reimagined chief executive, a president, a, a chancellor, who is thinking from the end, who has a vision, who focuses not just on strategic planning, but on vision planning. What do you want your school to look like at the end of this? What do you want? Who are you empowering to make the changes that are necessary for you to reimagine your university? Do you have a chief innovation officer, somebody who is charged with creating a vision committee, not a strategic planning committee, but a vision committee, where people who are not normally at the table, like the university registrar, like the career counselor, like the head of buildings and grounds, like a university professor who has an expertise in consumer spending, for example, and who could work with the admission office to help them to identify those applicants that are most likely to enroll based on consumer pattern of spending. The reimagined university, in my opinion, will be the greatest the greatest residual, if you will, the greatest residual of this pandemic. And I, we're at the beginning of this discussion. Today, we, I could speak and I'm, I hope that you would have questions that would keep us engaged for another hour. We don't have that time. My time is already, I've already spoken more than I'm supposed to. So I will turn this back over to Dr. Liu and Dr. Vista um, and we'll hopefully continue with uh, some questions from you. But I do believe that um, this is an opportunity for us, not just a challenge, not just a disruption, not just um, terrible times. I believe we can use this time to reimagine ourselves, the work we do, how we teach, how we administer, and how we make this enterprise for our students, whether domestic or international, a, an experience that will last for the rest of their lives. Thank you. Unmute, Dr. Liu. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for your informative and thoughtful uh, presentation, Ms. Denise. Um, in, the, in the next uh, about 15 minutes, Dr. Bista and me will join uh, Ms. Denise uh, to discuss uh, uh, some related topic about higher education, about COVID-19 and higher education, teaching and learning. So. Um, we have prepared some uh, um, discussion questions um, consistent with what uh, uh, Ms. Denise just shared with us. Um, here is uh, some questions maybe many of us have thinking about um, and also speak to Ms. Denise's presentation. What is the biggest uh, um, you know, a challenge or problem, obstacles that uh, universities and uh, uh, college um, might um, you know um, faced in this um, pandemic um dr lu i'll start off with that if you don't mind because i think sure. that uh, there are obstacles that are short term and there are mm -hmm. obstacles that are long term mm -hmm. so the short term obstacles are for most of you participating in today's webinar how am i going to teach who mm -hmm. is going to be in my classroom am i safe is my job safe? Is my department contracted? What about my funding? What about collaborations with colleagues? When will I be able to invite them to come to my campus? How many students will enroll in my university in the fall? 
That's a short term obstacle and it is an obstacle. But then there are the, the longer term obstacles. And that is what, again, I'm repeating myself from my, my presentation. What does I want? What does my university want this, our institution to look like to be, to be for our students after this is over, after, this, after the panic and after the confusion and the disruption of COVID-19 is over. So when we ask this question, and in my opinion, when we answer this question, it has to be both long-term and short-term obstacles. And the biggest obstacle that I feel short-term are enrollment and finances and the health of our faculty and students in their teaching modes. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is a um, very, um, insightful comments, um, Ms. Dennis, it make me think about what uh, my university, Ball State University, is actually doing now. I know it's really speak to, uh, uh, to what uh, uh, you just said, you know, my university actually have uh, like a, um, a strong planning team to uh, make a uh, um, return to campus plan that include uh, uh, several um, key several key uh, tips regarding like uh, what uh, uh, workplace uh, expect, uh, expectation about how we access uh, you know, buildings, how employee health scanning and the self uh, certification assessment, safety practice, travel standard wellness and uh, uh, general resource and even like including a very important request for leave or disability uh, commendation so on and so forth. So um, I agree with you that in order to understand higher education, COVID-19 and higher education, uh, teaching and learning, we need to understand uh, uh, this uh, pandemic's uh, uh, challenge, uh, our existing university structures. And uh, the, perhaps maybe sometimes it's, uh, um, it, uh, it provide, it, it actually provide us opportunities to restructure, reimagine, to reform our existing you know, universities. With that said, um, maybe we can focus more on like teaching and learning uh, topics because many of us uh, are higher education educator. So we have some questions that uh, uh, we not only want like our panelists to share our thoughts, but we also want to um, invite uh, our audience to share your perspective, your insight, uh, and your experience at your institutions you now with us. So uh, the next question focuses on particular on teaching. How are university college catching up? It's actually is this summer semester, and we already uh, experienced uh, uh, spring semester, how are universities catching up with online remote teaching? What could be some practical tips uh, for those in transitions? Okay, I will share my experience here. Um, as a uh, classroom teacher and being in, you know, uh, engaging with the students and colleagues uh, every day, I think we are missing that you know, real interaction uh, in person and the student participation in the clubs or organization, as well as their involvement in those labs. Um, however, I think, you know, as Ms. Denise has er er earlier mentioned that we are also learning ourselves, you know, and the gaining the new possibility, new direction of moving forward. A uh, few months ago, we didn't know how far we, we could go. Now, each of us, uh, you know, do have some sort of experience in online virtual teaching, use of technology, imagine yourself, the number of uh, virtual meetings that you have attended. Uh, many of the things were impossible, number of conferences, even in my personal case, I attended several CIES virtual meetings, you know, and have a more presence than even, even going in person uh, session. So that's something. And also I explore number of technology that enhance your teaching and learning with your students. So definitely, yes, you miss the, you know, the in-person interaction with the students. However, virtual uh, capacity uh, has given you the new direction. So it has, the use of technology has certainly empowered and inspired for many of us. 
Um, the couple of things I would highlight is, you know, instead of going through the difficulties, I think many of you might have, you know, experienced some of the challenges. When I ask you to make a list of challenges, definitely you have a ton of tons of, you know, list such as the student absence, the disengagement, maybe dishonesty or expectation of easy grades. But I, I would go with the more positive aspect of uh, your connection with the students. So to be an effective educators, I think instead of complaining, we have to focus our energy to redesigning curriculum pedagogy and looking into how you can maintain the quality and rigor probably we should invest you know, uh, or focus our energy to reviewing our assessment and outcomes uh, that work better in the context of pandemics. Uh, my colleagues, you know, Dr. Sarma has said, upper, you know, operationalizing humanity, look into more human aspect of, uh, you know, uh, our lives and, and also connect your students. Maybe, you know, we need to ask frequently our students what location they are joining us, what their health situation look like, did they have any disruption in the family due to COVID, any death or any illness, you know, those things, reliability of their internet or even electricity, right? So sometimes we fail to look into those basic things that, you know, connects, that makes you probably an effective uh, educators. Um, I think we have to, you know, trust our students, uh, provide more belongingness, um, and focus on creating guidelines for effective learning that helps, you know, how you include technology, how, uh, you know, you, you bring their opinions and, and then also feel, uh, make them empower. Um, you know, I have been combining both, you know, uh, synchronous and, um, you know, the recorded and both virtual and then recorded materials real time, um, you know, and also focusing on the recording uh, the lectures, some of these, you know, certain videos, that is helping very well. Um, I think the best way, again, uh, is I do in my uh, field, um, I teach social sciences and maybe those who are teaching in other lab or you know, engineering other field might be different. Be best thing is to ask the students, you know, write these some responses or summaries uh, about the classes and creating more meaningful interaction. Um, you may not believe, you know, uh, you know, the way we do in a face-to-face -face interaction, probably we should provide some breaks um, even in online, um, in online, you know, classes, the stretching, humors, and those things makes, you know, very um, positive meanings rather than having two or three hours non-stop virtual session. Um, and teach with the trust. You know, trust is critical to uh, be the effective teaching or teachers. Um, and you believe, you know, students who trust, who understand, appreciate the value of the course and ass assignment, they are definitely motivated to perform perform better. Um, and, and many, many of us, you know, fail to look into mirror, ask ourselves, yourself, how you teach, how you assess, how you treat students and how you evaluate their, their work that reveals much about us. Um, so it, it has given an opportunity, at least for me, to look, you know, into my teaching practices, how I do and how I cope with the situation with my uh, students. The other thing I have been learning is, uh, you know, I teach both online and face-to-face, -face, is adopting technology and learning as we go, uh, as we move forward. So, you know, you, probably you don't realize how much you are resisting to the technology, not making a positive shift. Um, you know, uh, Madam Denise has our earlier mentioned the chief innovation officer. I think we should be that officer ourselves in our role. So if you are a faculty, if you are an admin or a staff, why not you consider yourself that innovative innovation of a picture uh, to innovate yourself, you know, provide, provide some, you know, um, incentive for yourself for doing something differently. Um, for me, I've been learning a lot now, you know, using the virtual background to developing some of the program courses or materials for the students uh, as, as their needs or as a student request. Um, so if you had a, you know, um, administrator, definitely yes, look into the, you know, best way to reward and provide in incentives for faculty members who are doing uh, things differently and that's, that's working better. Um, and at my university, uh, you know, senior level administrators are, are constantly asking faculty members if they have new ideas, if they want to collaborate, if they want to provide, you know, trainings or some experience, their experience with the fellow faculty members. 
Um, and it's working well, despite, you know, the other chaos that's happening. And this is global and, you know, taking place across the globes. We don't have control. And probably the best thing is to do what we can do now. Uh, so that's my, you know, reflection. And back to you, Dr. Liu. Thank you, Dr. Bista. Because uh, uh, Dr. Bista and uh, I uh, have worked uh, for years, I know him well. His research, uh, what I hear from him, uh, you know, it's, he's not only talking about like uh, um, some uh, um, uh, thoughts, insight about uh, on these questions, on these discussion questions, but also he meaningfully connect his research focus as I, I just introduced at the beginning of this webinar. Uh, he has a strong expertise in student engagement, uh, faculty uh, and student relations, the role of advisors, you know, how we can think about learning strategies in higher education that can effectively engage students in this like a, not only face-to-face -face class, but also online remote teaching that we, many of us have to do in this pandemic, right? So um, with my experience, uh, it's very interesting. I work at uh, Ball State University uh, Teachers College. Uh, we have long tradition of providing our students uh, remote uh, uh, distance, uh, sometimes we call distance online education because for example, as a uh, um, use my experience, I teach both uh, um, master and PhD student uh, um, course regarding uh, curriculum uh, development, uh, curriculum studies, and many of my students are in classroom teachers. So each semester I teach, uh, uh, I teach one face-to-face -face course on curriculum studies, you know, uh, and plus, other you know online student uh, online course so um, I feel like this uh, um, this spring semester this past spring semester uh, I didn't find uh, uh, my teaching um, helping um, this disrupted a lot in from my end but of course uh, many of my students are k-12 teachers their schedules their work have been uh, significantly uh, this uh, disrupted I as like uh, Dr. Bista mentioned, you know, I have to, I need to think more about how I can bring um, student frustration, anxiety um, related to the pandemics so to the course work, right? It to re required me to reconsider re my teaching strategies. But in terms of the format of my teaching, because of my institution, teachers college, have been work on the online distance education for years. We accumulated some, you know, um, remote uh, teaching experience uh, with the student. But for another department at my university, many of our colleagues have been work uh, um, on campus to teach face-to-face uh, uh, -face class. Um, sometimes it has been challenged for them to move uh, their face-to-face a, a classroom to online one. My university, um, you know, have um, well used uh, a division called online strategic learning uh, division department to provide software and uh, um, workshop to faculties. So with that said, for example, um, in prepare for the reopening the fall semester, uh, and uh, during the summer, my university have do some uh, um, service for faculties to uh, collect the concern questions, problems, or requests, and using the summer time to prepare uh, to teach you know, faculties how to use uh, online module and uh, even some uh, like specific software to redesign uh, the, the course. This is something like a uh, have happened in my university in terms of like a, a institutional change, institutional uh, response to uh, how we can uh, engage students uh, in learning in the upcoming semesters and um, uh, prepare, well prepare faculties to, um, to well learn you now uh, technology and uh, how to design um, curriculum in the uh, using the online module. So, so that is my um, experience and perhaps maybe, you know, we can call the practical uh, tips for um, institutions. Very interestingly, I want to share my uh, you know, uh, next experience with you. It's in spring uh, academic semester, I think it's 20, 2018 to 2019. 
I joined, participated in um, um, faculty learning community organized by um, online strategic learning at Ball State University. In that uh, learning community, many uh, faculties from uh, you know the whole campus to form um, a study study group to learn how to use uh, you know, online to, to design, uh, redesign curriculum, engage the adult learners uh, into learning. That is kind of like a, a prepared at least, uh, you know, um, the learning community, uh, faculty learning community members. So perhaps maybe for other institutions, including my institution in the future, you know, we can do more on that. Um, this might be the part of what uh, um, Miss Denise said, and you know how we reimagine you know, higher education, you know some aspect of teaching learning. So I would like to say that. Mm -hmm. So with with that said, uh, I uh, we would like to hear from audience what are your experience, what what are your um, you know um, thoughts regarding how does. Uh, COVID-19 impact the way in which, uh, um, if you are student, students uh, are taught at college university, if you are faculty, you know, how you know, this pandemic impact the way you taught. So this, uh, today's webinar is a little different from, uh, from a previous one. When we want our audience have opportunity to engage this uh, uh, interactive conversation because the topic you know, is related to all of us, right? So if you have thoughts, ideas you want to share, please join us. So we can come by Q&A session and uh, um, the panel conversation together to share your experience, your insights. That's right. You can unmute your microphone if mm -hmm. you want to share some information. And I see uh, interesting in interaction going on in the chat room. Dr. Smith mm -hmm. has been posting some information. Dr. Smith, would you like to take us in a 30 second to update on the conference or some of the information or anyone wants to say something, please let me know. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope you can unmute your microphone there. Um, if have uh, you have any technical issues, challenge, I am here to help you as well. All right, then the floor is open. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smith. Uh, sure, can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, the uh, the sessions I'm talking about, I'm a director of a conference, uh, sort of one of my side jobs, I guess. Uh, I, I direct a conference in the US, but has worldwide focus on uh, strategic enrollment management. And it's, it's speaking a lot about what Marguerite was uh, uh, speaking to. Uh, and our focus this time is to take a conference, which normally has about, I don't know, about a thousand participants and uh, take it completely in person to completely virtual, but in doing so, put our focus on the crises that we're facing in higher education at the moment, of which two are particularly important to us. The, the first one is COVID-19, uh, and how do, how, do we, how do we get through this? How do, we, how do we adapt to it? How do we change? How do we continue to change? Uh, what, will, what, will the, what will higher education look like? And how do the enrollment management folks support uh, the various discussions on their campus to that effect. So that's one. And the second one, of course, ties into the Black Lives Matter uh, discussion and in particular, uh, but also just broadly, the notion of social justice and equity as, as we move forward as well. And, and in, in fact, these two things just tie together. Uh, our, our sense is that as institutions are doing some adaptation, uh, issues about equity uh, uh, may not be at, at the top of the agenda. And so we want to have that kind of a conversation. So, uh, and at the moment, uh, we're, we're, ex we're looking for proposals, workshops, best practice sessions, roundtables. So any, any ideas you have, feel free to float them to me. Uh, I'll, I'll put my email address into the chat link. The second thing I've, I've mentioned to you is that we're in the process of exploring this whole idea of, of the international student experience as it relates to open and online learning. and. Uh, uh, and working on a research project as we speak uh, that, that Dr. Bissler is uh, aware of. And, and as we were doing that, it occurred to us that, well, now we're in the middle of COVID-19 and everybody is doing uh, open and online learning. And so 
So we paused our research a little bit, and in doing so, we, we thought it might be great to have a research symposium on that topic. And so we're trying to bring together uh, virtually, which allows us to have a wider audience um, on that topic, but also to, to begin the, the idea of connecting researchers together. And so this particular research symposium will be a one-day event followed a week later by a, a one-day uh, networking uh, connection kind of opportunity. So those are the two things that I'm involved in. Uh, and uh, again, I want to thank the, the organizers for this webinar. This is, this is spot on. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I see some of uh, our, our other colleagues are also willing to say something. So next uh, we have here Tina. Tina wants to say something. Tina, I guess you can unmute your microphone. Hi. Hi. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here. Um, I mean, yeah, I also, this summer is really crazy. I've been uh, changing all uh, curriculum and instructions to teach online. And also I'm teaching, uh, my, most of the students are international students. So we needed to provide it online uh, seminar course for international students. Everything is just really crazy. And then one thing, um, that's why this, um, uh, uh, the webinar is so meaningful for me to think as a researcher and also as an educator, how we can deal with these situations as an opportunity. But one thing um, really makes me really, um, I mean, this is a question or we can discuss more. While listening to this, uh, today's webinar, I've been thinking a lot about um, open education resources. And then um, Dr. Denise emphasized we needed to collaborate, but then um, I'm thinking collaborate with whom and how between institutions. And before that, I was, I was very optimistic regarding open resource education, but then now I realized in this COVID-19 situation, to what extent and how much the institutions want to use and open their uh, educational resources and then at the um, their knowledge and then their skill set you know uh, and then also uh, the other um, my concern is that online education is not cheap but in somehow we have very wrong um, uh, how can I say stereotypes or perspectives online should it be cheap online is cheap but that can be cheap once we have an infrastructure but how many institutions are now ready to provide a quality online education, then I'm concerning that in this COVID-19 situation is threatening to the um, little small college and universities and or maybe bigger, larger universities um, can be dominant in this education and market. I, I, I hate to say the market, but you know, e environment. And especially in the global wise, so luckily, the, um, my institution that I'm working, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, we have a strong foundation and resources to support the students and faculty in terms of online education. But I don't know. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling. But these are two my big concern in, um, in this COVID-19. Um, yeah. Thank Could you. I answer that, um, please? Uh, yes. I think this is a perfect example of what in a reimagined university you would take to the vision committee that's chaired by a chief innovation officer. You have an idea and you're thinking from the end that you want to collaborate, but you don't know how to do it. Okay, you should not be uh, charged with doing that on your own. This should be taken to a committee that, that has been put together by, your, by the head of your university to take suggestions such as you have just made and make them happen. How can we collaborate? How can we, how can we uh, get through the financial implications of a, a totally online uh, program? This is a perfect example of what I was trying to illustrate before. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go through all of that. But this is something that, uh, not a strategic planning committee and not your department and not your department chair, but the university as a whole, because what you are suggesting would affect all, would impact all <clears throat> departments. And so I 
thank you for it because you've uh, you've illustrated to me, and I hadn't quite thought about it in that way. But this is a this is a question for your vision committee to answer. Thank so, you, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I know we have you know a couple of minutes left. Uh, I have a couple of questions here from other colleagues as well. So I'd like to invite Professor uh, Dr. Ratnagos, uh, see the distin distinguished professor and then former. Uh, president of the CIES, our advisor of the um, study abroad and international student special interest group, uh, sits from McGill University. So, Professor Ghosh, uh, you have a question for us, right, for the panel? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, very, very, very interesting. Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, asking, do you have any ideas on how one can reimagine what we have been doing in the last few years, uh, something that has been increasing a lot, which is student and faculty mobility. How could we reimagine it? I mean, what do you have any ideas on that? Do we have another hour? Can we extend this for another hour? I do. And if you, um, uh, Dr. Poe, give me, uh, send me your contact information. I have put together uh, a series of informational bulletins on the reimagined university that talks about this, but also I will be writing a white paper or a monograph outlining my ideas, not for the academic part, but for the administrative part and the international student mobility part of how we can reimagine. And I'd be happy to send that to you. But it's a it's a great question. We could I could speak for an hour on it because I've been spending the last four months reimagining what it would be like to work in a different kind of university where you don't have the silos, where you don't have the restrictions, where you don't have the but we never did it that way. I can't think out of the box. I can't think in the box. We have to have people who think with no box. No box. Not in or out, but no box. So please send me your contact information and I will send you what I have written so far on the reimagined university and then send you my white paper when it's finished, when my research is finished. That would be very good for me. Good, thank I you. Been, I have been wondering, but I, I can't come up with many, very many ideas. So that would be extremely helpful for please me. Please send you. me your contact information I and I will get it out to you within the next two days. Thank you so much, bye. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for all audience and uh, our panelists to, to share your, um, you know, unique perspective insights. So it's all of us. And now today's uh, conversation is quite dynamic. Yeah, the, the, the one hour is uh, definitely not enough. We will plan, you know, more uh, webinars. This is why, you know, webinars uh, provide us uh, a useful, uh, you know, platform to to share our concern, as Tina, you know, just share with us, and uh, uh, Miss Denise responded, and uh, uh, you know, uh, another co wonderful colleagues, uh, you know, ask the questions. We actually think about the webinar we initiated. It's just a starting starting point. You know, we have many, you know. Uh, questions we need to think about. We want to use the platform um, for all of us to share um, our concern uh, and um, our idea. On the behalf of STAR on Scholars Network, I would like to thank you, Ms. Denise and Ms. Uh, Dr. Bista again for your uh, presentation and um, your discussion. Um, and also want to uh, um, to thank you all audience for joining us today to share your concern questions. And the STAR Scholars Network will offer us, you know, another upcoming webinars regarding uh, higher education. The upcoming one in next month is regarding, um, is about uh, tips for publications. So to find more information, please visit uh, STAR uh, Scholars Network uh, website. So um, we will continue the conversation. Please email it to uh, the panelist if you have any question. Mm -hmm. If you have any question, um, now this is uh, Miss Denise's uh, email address. Myself, uh, Dr. Uh, Bistand, uh, Dr. Uh, Gall is the president of uh, STAR. So thank you for all of you joining uh, today. Dr. Bistand.
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, could you go to the one more slide um, the ne before that? Yes, that's the, one, the certificate one. Could, could you tell okay. the, our guest uh, for those who are willing to get the certificates? Uh huh. Okay, thank you. Do yes. folks have any more questions, or if you want to um, share your questions or collaborations or like suggestions for our webinar, please you know uh, feel free to share your suggestion advice about like how we can uh, use this uh, star webinar uh, platform to um, organize the more meaningful topic uh, that. Uh, might be uh, really uh, meaningful and useful to you. So we are open to your suggestion and feedback before we wrap up, you know, uh, before you leave. So if you have any suggestions, advice for uh, 